you and God bless our pianist. And we appreciate Joan Griffith at the piano tonight singing that song. Wow, what is happening with our country and how we're seeing the leadership be so strong now and things that are happening that help to make America great again. We thank God for recent years and what's happening with uh, just a regular guy. Yet God is behind it. And when God's behind it, uh, you're going to see many, many wonderful things that come out of it. So God is bringing us back to our to our funding, founding uh, principles, and God bless and what happens with our leadership with uh, Trump and Pence. So uh, things are moving. Uh, we're going into Jerusalem now, and we hear talk about the temple being rebuilt. We're hearing the talk about uh, the wall being built. And so these are things that are found in, of course, Zechariah chapter 8 is there heavy about the temple and, and many things that deal with the second coming of Christ, the temple, that must be as Paul talks about it in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. Tonight, Christian soldier, I love you, God loves you, and for a moment, think of this for a second. Can you understand that you can't make God mad at you because he loves you, you're a patriot, you're saved, you're the elect. God has chosen you. That word elect is used 27 times. And you've accepted that. God has put that in your mind. You know that Jesus is your Savior. You see that in John 1.12, it tells you that you don't do anything to be saved. John 1.12. For as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. I don't know if you can make any work out of that, okay? You're in the business to receive the immeasurable, indescribable, mammoth love of Almighty God from the universe. Who can understand who God is? Uh, I mean, it's greater than all the stars put together. His energy, His power, His might, His love, kindness, gentleness, loving mercies, grace, all wrapped up in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and God loves you tonight, you're not going to make him mad, Christian soldier. And when you're out of order and you're not treating somebody else kind and thoughtful, one of your brothers, that, of course, you can hurt Jesus' feelings. But uh, understand, he'll always love you and he'll always forgive you and he'll always take care of you. You're one of his sheep and he's a shepherd and he's never going to blot you out of his hand. And John 10 says that. So tonight, Christian soldier, uh, the gift of God is mentioned by Paul 60 times in salvation. It's a gift of God. Gift, free, and grace is mentioned nine times in Romans 5, 15 to 20. Nine times free, gift, and grace. Wonderful, the love of God, the gift of God. And then the, the phrase gift of God uh, is mentioned by Brother Paul eight times in Romans. It's a gift of God. Faith is mentioned 250 times in the scripture, and that's, that's a lot of times that you're saved by your faith in what Jesus has created and done and provided for you, the immeasurable love of Almighty God through Christ at the cross. And I don't know, maybe you can think of 20 different words, but think about them. The love of God, wonderful words, mercy, goodness, and love, and compassion, and thoughtfulness, and kindness, and he loves you. You're not going to make him mad. He'll, he'll forgive you when you're out of order. He loves you, and he wants to show that too. It's free, it's gift, it's grace, and nothing is clearer than John uh, 1, 12. As many as received him gave the power to become the sons of God, even to those that believe on his name. Ninety-nine times in the book of John it says, Believe, ninety-nine times, believe, believed, or believeth, and the word repent is not used. Uh, in the book of John. So we don't repent to be saved. We repent all through our life because we are saved. We're saved by faith. We repent. And you're not going to get God to change his mind about anything. And so God is a perfect God. He's written it all down. He's put it in the Bible and scriptures. Uh, he's preserved it. The King James was written by God. And way back in 1382 to 1610, it was written in such a fashion so that you would know and understand from a sixth grade level, a reading level, you'd understand the English language. That's why I stay way back. I'm still in the King James, you know, so thank God for that. So tonight, the, the word elect, 
were chosen by God, mentioned 27 times in the New Testament, 27 times, that we're the elect of God. He chooses us according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children according to the measure of his of faith uh, in the love of Jesus Christ. And that's Ephesians 1, 4, and 5. He has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, we hold him and without blame. And that means you've been predestinated to be saved by God Almighty and kind of put you in the field called the Calvinist, and that word may scare you, you know. But when you're reading the book uh, of John, <laughs> you'll find that you don't have to have the word there, but you'll understand that God is, uh, like it says this in uh, uh, John 8, 44, God hath chosen us in him. Uh, he didn't, you didn't choose him, he chose you. And he chose us, and it says that, you know, God has chosen us and put the Spirit upon us. Can no man can call Jesus the Lord by the Holy Ghost. And that means that God has to show you that, choose you and enlighten you so that you call Jesus. The word Lord means that he is the same as God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. That's John 1.1. 1, 1. So the Bible and the Word is God. And when you read the Bible, you're reading the scriptures and you're looking at God. Here's a beautiful verse. He that believeth on him on Christ is not condemned. John 3.18. He that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. John uh, uh, 3.36. He that believeth on the Son, just believe. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. What a beautiful verse. John 5, 24 now. Truly, truly, I say to you, he that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, will not come into the condemnation at all, face no judgment, no hell, but is passed from death into life, simply believing. So we have that all through the scripture, 99 times, the word believe, and you, you accept that. I trust, Christian soldier. Beautiful. I said therefore unto you that you'll die in your sins. If you believe not that I am, that Christ is uh, equal with God the Father, the I am, you'll die in your sins, John 8, 24, and hundreds of other verses, and Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved, it's the cross, through faith that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of any works, this man should boast, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and in Ephesians 1, 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, as through the blood of the cross. And we know that the Bible is pure and it's perfect, Psalm 119, 140. The word of God is pure, and therefore of that servant, servant liveth it. Loveth it. And Psalm 12 tells us how pure and perfect the word of God is. Psalm 12 tells us that God from the foundation of the world has kept the scriptures pure and perfect. And so it says that the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth. Psalm 12, 6 and 7. Words of God like silver in a furnace of earth, purified seven times as perfect. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, preserve them from the, this generation forever. That's why we stay with the King James, because the words are uh, spoken in, uh, in languages and tongues. God spoke in tongues and brought the King James and we thank God for that Christian soldier. He spoke in English to save the whole world way back there and finished it in 1610 and uh, sealed by the Holy Spirit. And God spoke that language in the language of English. He speaks in tongues and he did in the King James. So that's a marvel how God's able to do that. I'm in the book of, of uh, Numbers looking at the patriots. Now there's a lot of patriots. Do you remember any of these patriots that we studied in the last year or so? Uh, I think you probably remember some, huh? And you remember there, there was uh, Gideon, and remember how the angel came to him and uh, the, he, God killed 186,000 with Gideon with 30, 300 men, remember that? Yes, uh-huh. And then it was David that killed Goliath by knocking him out with a stone and coming and cutting his head off. He was too big to fight, I guess, like that, so he knocked him out. <clears throat> and then 
uh, was able to come back and uh, cut his head off. And then, of course, Job proved that he was a man of God, his faith, you know, when everything went wrong, he lost his family, lost his uh, health, and had boils all over him. He, he wouldn't curse God at all. And so that was Job. And then Joshua saw the walls of Jericho fall down. Samson, of course, killed a thousand with a job on him and asked, and then prayed that God would help him kill 3,000 people and commit suicide. And then uh, Samson's name is in Hebrews 11 as a patriot, a man of faith. So we have many of those tonight. We'll be looking at this one here. And so you got your King James, please, and look with me now. We're studying in the book of Numbers. So turn in your back in your Bible, way back in the book of Numbers. Balaam was just a man. He was just like David. He was just like Solomon. He was just a man uh, like I am, like you are, a Christian patriot. You know? And so Balaam is going to be asked of God to bring some of the greatest prophecies that you've ever heard of that are in the Bible. And he was a regular guy. And he gets overwhelmed because that's the nature of man. So we're looking at Numbers chapter 22. And the children of Israel... Uh, they're there, very close to what we call the Moabites in chapter 22.1. It's right by the Jordan River. And these Moabites are six different tribes, and they're all the children of what we call the Muslims, the Moslems, the Islam, Mohammedism. You know, we have all the people that are from Esau and from Jacob and from some of Abraham's tribe. And today we call them the Palestinians, and they're all in the areas of Lebanon, Syria, you know, and Iran and Iraq in that little area there and so that's where he's at and we're talking about Numbers 22 and so uh, we're talking about you know uh, approximately 1800 years ago 1500 years ago and so uh, here comes this man who is a priest and a king and his name is Balak and so you'll see his name Balak there and uh, uh, verse 2 22 2 Numbers 22.2 and Bala, he is the priest and the king uh, of the Amorites uh, and they're sacrificing their children uh, to all the different stars and uh, what we call the Masroth, all the different animals and to uh, uh, the host of heaven. And so we have that all mixed in today uh, with uh, the Freemasons and they have all the signs and symbols of all the things that deal with worshiping the stars of heaven in the Maseroth. And so they've been sacrificing their children, but they're terrified of the Jews of Israel. And so uh, Balak now, he's terrified. Him, and he said, what are we going to do? We can't stop this because uh, the Jews are overpowering us. Wherever they go, they win. And so they, they come to Balaam. Balaam is a priest. He's a king. And he represents a, a group of people there. Uh, for the Jews, for the Israelites. And so they come to him and say, Balaam, we need you to curse these people because they're too strong for us. And no matter what you do, uh, or what we do, we can't overpower them. And whoever you curse is cursed, and whoever you bless is blessed. This is 22 6. So Balaam, come curse these people. Balaam said, Well, wait a minute, you know, they're my people. You want me to curse my. He said, Look, we're going to give you all the gold that you can imagine. We'll put it in a wagon load. Gold and silver, we're going to make you very famous. And uh, everybody in the whole world uh, will uh, honor you. In verse 17, 22, 17. And he says, uh, we'll promote you to great honor. And uh, wherever you go, you're going to have gold and silver. Verse 18, 22, 18. You won't be able to uh, do anything but share your wealth with those around you. And would you come? And would you curse these people, 22, 12? And Balaam said, wait a minute, don't go with him. God stopped Balaam and said, wait a minute, Balaam. They're, they're serving the devil. They're serving Satan. They're serving Baal. They're serving Ashtaroth. And the god, uh, Lucifer. Can't you understand that? Don't do that. And, and so Balaam said, well, it's okay. Can I just go along with him? Uh, you know, he's going to give me all this gold. And uh, God said, okay, I'm going to test you. You go with him, but don't you say anything. Don't, don't mention one word about blessing. 
Don't say that now. If you do, you're in trouble. So Balaam says, okay. So Balaam goes, and he starts heading over there to uh, do the, the, the cursing of his own people. He gets going just a little bit, and you look at verse uh, 22. We're at 22-22. We're numbers, and you're there with your uh, King James Version, brother. Hope you're there, 22 20. And here comes a donkey, that is, he has a donkey riding, and here comes an angel of the Lord. And uh, God is uh, seeing, the angel of the Lord sees him there in verse 23, chapter 22, 23. And the angel of the Lord is there, and Balaam is riding a donkey, a jackass. And the donkey is scared to death when he sees that angel of the Lord with a big sword drawn. And the angel of the Lord draws his sword and the donkey is terrified and falls down on the ground and, and bruises the leg and hurts the leg of, uh, uh, of Balaam. So it crushes his leg. And so uh, Balaam whacks him three times. He gets a stick and whacks him real hard. Three times he whacks him. And then the donkey begins to speak to him. Verse 28. Here the donkey is now talking. And the Lord opened the mouth of the jackass and the donkey, she said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you would hit me, that you smote me, that you have smitten me three times? Why'd you do that? And then he said, Well, you know, I've always been good to you, Balaam. I've carried you around. And so the donkey is actually telling Balaam that what he's doing. And so uh, he sees this in a trance. The angel of the Lord, verse 31. And so he bows down. Balaam bows down to the angel of the Lord. And they fall down flat on the ground. And uh, the angel of the Lord says to him in verse 32, Your way is perverse before me. Verse 32. 22, 32. And the jackass turned around three different times and, uh, you know, and, and recognized the angel of the Lord. And then so, then Balaam now says to the Lord, I'm sorry. And the angel of the Lord said, You know, I could have killed you. Don't you understand? The angel said to Balaam, I could have killed you because your way is perverted. It's perverse. You're not doing what God wants you to do. And so you're perverted. And that's what he says. Uh, and I could have uh, killed you. And so the angel of the Lord now is standing in the way. And in verse number 35, the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but only the word that I speak to you are you to speak. Don't say anything what I tell you. Because whatever you do, you're blessed. You see, don't change anything at all just because he's going to pay you a lot of money. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak. So they got 10 or 15. All of them, they're all part of the clergy there with Balak, who is a king and priest, all the children that worship the demons and the devils and what we call Baal today. And we have that same group uh, that worship in the mosque. So Balaam there in chapter 22 uh, verse 35, uh, he goes along and he said, well, I want you to do, and he goes to chapter 23. He said, we're going to go up to the top of the mountain. So they go up to the top of the mountains of Pisgah. And we're in chapter 23. And so Balaam says, okay, I tell you what, let's find out if God's with us. Because if God is with us, we'll sacrifice. And if God is with us, fire will come down like with Elijah. Remember when the 450 prophets of Baal? And Elijah uh, prayed real hard and, and said a, a prayer of 15 words. And then all the people changed their mind and fell down and began to worship uh, the, the God of Elijah. And so he's, he's reminding him there. And so chapter 23, they went to the top of the mountains and they built there seven altars. And on those seven altars they put uh, uh, rams on one of them and cows on the other. And so they had seven rams on one and seven cows together. So seven rams and seven cows. And this is spoken of uh, in verse 2. 23, 2. Balak said to Balaam, uh, you know, put a bullock and a ram. So they did. And Balaam then uh, was able to put a bullock, uh, a cow, and he put a ram on the top of the altar there at the top of the mountains of Pisgah. And so, uh, and then they went out, out now, as they got this 
these uh, animals on the top, seven rams, seven cows, and they're on the top of the altars at the top of Pisgah, because this is, you know, they thought, well, Balak said, surely God will honor this. They go back, and you know there's no fire. No fire at all. In other words, they stand back and said, well, the fire's going to come down, you know, God's going to, they didn't put any fire in there. And so, it's evident that when the fire didn't come, that God did not honor what was being put there with the animals and the sacrifice. And so Balak was very upset by it. And then immediately Balaam begins to uh, talk about how wonderful God is. And he, and he says, uh, you know, how wonderful God is. Verse 9, 23, 9. From the top of the rocks I see him, referring to Israel. And from the hills, Israel, I behold him. And lo, the people, Israel, they dwell alone. And they shall not be reckoned among the nation who can count the dust of Jacob and the number of the four part See, And so he tells and curses, he doesn't curse him, but he blesses. 23, 9 and 10. At the top of the mountains there's no fire. And so instead of, he doesn't curse, he blesses them. Well, and then Balak is very angry. And he said, I told you to bless them, not to curse. Uh, and I told you to curse them and you're blessing them. This is verse 11. I took you to curse my enemies, and you have blessed them all together. And so, what are we going to do about that? So, well, let's try it again. And so they do it two more times. And so they do the same thing. They put the seven cows and the seven rams, and they put it on top of the mountain again, and they go back to see whether the fire is coming down. And the fire doesn't come down. And then it says here in verse 19, this is the third... This is the second test that they have, and they're at the top of the mountains. And then Balaam says about Israel, verse 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie. God can't tell. God is an infinite being that uses a computer and calculates uh, the size, density of the stars and planets going all around the sun. God is infinitely put that together, all the different millions and trillions and zillions of parts to make a tree, to make a plant, and to make animals and, and the exchanging of all the gases, Christian soldier. God is infinite and wise, and that's what he's saying. He's not a man that he's going to repent, 23, verse 19. And God is good, and he said, I've received commandment to bless, I can't curse. And then they did it, the same thing again, you see. And then there's a third time when they're, they're doing the same test again. This is down in verse... 27 and uh, so in 27 they got seven cows and seven rams once again the third time at the top of Mount Pisgah and uh, they wait to see the fire come down verse 29 they got seven altars and they got seven cows and seven bullocks there verse 30 23 30 there's no fire comes down in other words the fire that would normally come down when God does a great miracle nothing happens and so Balaam says, it's over. We've done three, the number of God of perfection. And so uh, right now we're, we quit. And so in chapter 24, one, he stops. Completely gives up and said, look, it's all over. How wonderful are the tents of Jacob of Israel? 24, five, see. But now he says one of the prophecies here. And he talks about how great is going to be Israel. And he speaks this. This is a prophecy now of Balaam, and he's talking about uh, verse 8, Israel, how powerful Israel is going to be one day with Britain, and uh, we have that, all the different nations that Britain ruled, there are 20 nations, Great Britain and the United States. He's talking about Great Britain and the United States, Manasseh and Ephraim, and in verse number 8, 24-8, uh, they're going to be powerful, and they are today. Great Britain and the United States right now are the most powerful nations on the face of the earth, and he brought, brings him forth like a unicorn. And uh, he says, he crouches down like a lion. That's the, the symbol for the great power of power and wealth of, of Great Britain. And as a great lion, this is 24-9. The future of Great Britain, the United States, and Donald Trump, uh, and what we have going today, verse 9, 24-9. Blessed is he that blesses thee. Cursed is he that curses you. And then Balak is very angry. And he is a priest of, uh, of, the, of the Moabites. 
Amorites, what we call Islam, and the children today of the Palestinians. And then verse 10, Balak is very angry and he smacks his hands together and he said, I called you to bless them. I called you to curse these people and you blessed them these three times. And so here's the prophecy. This is the end of our little story today. Numbers 24, verse 17. The message is, Jesus has got to come back and be the king. And so here, Balaam now gives us one of the greatest prophecies in the whole Bible. It's a prophecy that here is going to come a star in the universe. We've only got billions of them, okay? But there's going to be one star, and his name is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And he's going to come, and he's going to rule the whole world, be king over whole, all the world. And this is the prophecy, 24, 17. This is the whole message here, why we came here tonight. We came here because God is going to finish out the blessings in the United States, and all of us, we're all going to be seeing the millennium shortly. Jesus is coming. The millennium is going to be there for a thousand years. Jesus is going to be the king, and he's talking about it in verse 17. I shall see him. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. But not now. You're going to have to wait 3,500 years, he said. I shall behold him. You're going to see him from Balaam to today, about 3,500 years. You're going to have to wait. And there shall come a star. Here comes a great star. Stars are made of hydrogen gas. Here comes a great star. It's powerful. It's, you know, like our sun. How can you describe a ball of gas as powerful as our sun, other than it would burn you up if you even get halfway close to it, see? And so you're going to see Jesus like a star, verse 17. He's coming as a star, like a ball of gas, a hot gas. He's coming out of Jacob. He's coming from the Jew. He's coming as a scepter. Scepter means he has in his hand the ruling power of a mighty king. It's a, it's a wand, it's a stick. It's got jewels all over it. And you wave it. It's the power of the king of Great Britain, the power of the king here with Donald Trump. And he represents the United States. The United States comes from Jerusalem. Right in the middle of the word Jerusalem are the three letters U-S-A. So the USA is right in the middle of Jerusalem. So the whole prophecy of the United States, Donald Trump, and what he's doing, he's talking about a star here. Jesus is coming to rule the whole world, Christian soldier. Verse 17. And there come a star out of Jacob. This is Jesus. He's got a scepter in his hand. He's going to be king. And then he's going to destroy all the children of Chad. This means when he comes back, he wipes out all the Palestinians, the Muslims, those that, that worship uh, Islam and those that go to the mosque. All of those are going to come to an end. That's what he said. And that's the children of Shep. It's coming to an end. When Jesus comes back to rule for a thousand years, he wipes out everybody except Christian soldiers. In verse 18, Edom shall be a possession. Edom is uh, what we call the Holy Land which today, would be Jordan. So Jordan, that whole area right next to Iran, all of them are going to be wiped out. And then Jacob, which is Israel, verse 19, 2419, Israel is going to have dominion and control, but they will destroy everybody that stays in that area. It's going to be wiped out, part of the prophecy called the Battle of Armageddon, and we get into that later. Now, Christian soldier, all of this is trying to tell us that uh, Jesus is the king. He's the star. Would you look at Matthew chapter 2 now? And I'll take a deep breath. <laughs> And, and start talking about Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2 is Jesus is going to be born like a star, but he's got to be born in Bethlehem because that's a prophecy of Micah chapter 5, 1 and 2. So in chapter uh, Matthew chapter 2, we have Herod now wanting to kill all the little babies. Chapter 2 of Matthew, Jesus is going to be born the king. He has to start out like a little baby in Mother Mary's womb. Matthew chapter 2. And when Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, in the days of Herod the king, there came wise men from the east. These are the Magi. They're coming from Iran, and they're coming just not far. Within 100 miles, you can be from Iran over to, uh, you can be in Israel. So it's not a long distance. We think, well, that's, you know, a thousand. No, it wasn't. So today we know that Jerusalem is really uh, only 50 to 100 miles from Iran, and that's where they were. 
Where is the king born? Where is this born king of the Jew? We saw a star. We saw it in the east. What is that star? Well, it may have been a moving asteroid. Some would say it was a moving star, a moving asteroid. We're not sure. You can guess that. Everybody guesses. But it represents Jesus. And they saw it in the sky. The mixture of maybe two, two stars coming together, some say. And then Herod, he wants to kill all the Jews. Verse 7 and 8. Chapter Matthew 2, 7 and 8. He calls the wise men and said, where did you see the star? When did you see it? And they said, well, we saw the star. You know, we only saw it, in the, he said, just a few weeks ago, a month ago. And so uh, Herod is now going to go and search diligently in Bethlehem because the child was supposed to be born in Bethlehem. And so they go and they don't find him. And Jesus now is a young child, verse number 11. And when they were coming to the house, now Jesus is somewhere between one and two, and they've looked everywhere, and they now worship Jesus, and there he is in the house. And then he's about one and a half, two years of age, chapter two. Herod is killing all the babies, and, but he's letting the older ones live. And so Jesus is alive, he's in the house, chapter 24, I mean Matthew chapter two, verse 11. And so they give him gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and they worship him, which means if they were not, they, they would be blaspheming if he was not the Son of God. Herod is really angry, verse 16, and he goes out and he kills all the children in Bethlehem in his anger. Uh, this is Matthew chapter 2. And so uh, Jesus goes and lives the rest of his natural life in verse 23. He goes to Nazareth. And there he works as a carpenter, and he's called a Nazarene, and that's Matthew uh, chapter 2, verse number 23. That's the story now. Jesus is born to be the king, and he's born in Bethlehem. He's called the star, and now we get into something else. I want you to look at Matthew. I want you to look at John now. Here in the book of John, I counted nine times in the book of John. Would you turn there? Turn to John, please. And would you look at John and notice something here. I'm in John uh, chapter number 18, verse 12. John 18, 12. Here we have Jesus is taken now. They're going to kill him. And this is a star. This is uh, the king that's coming to rule the whole world. But Jesus has to die because if he doesn't die, you don't go to heaven. If Jesus doesn't die, you can't marry him. You can't go to the millennium. So the whole plan is that Jesus has to pay for your sins and mine. And that's why we sang the song, The Old Rugged Cross, at the beginning of the sermon. Christian soldier, God loves you. He cares for you. You can't make Jesus mad, uh, at, mad enough not uh, to listen to you and care about you. I mean, you hurt Jesus' feeling, but he'll always love you, always care for you. And even when you don't love one another, which breaks his heart, he still loves you because he's God. And he can't get God to change. God is an infinite being. And Jesus loves you with indescribable, insurmountable, caring and loving and appreciation for you as a human being, fallen as you are, of sin. Okay. In John 18, we're looking at nine places where uh, Jesus is called the king. And I'm looking at verse 12 and 14 as they kill him. John 18, 12. The man and the captain, the officers of the Jews, uh, they take Jesus and they bind him. And they bring him like a criminal and they take him at night to Caiaphas' house. This is verse 13. Instead of taking him to the court for trial, they take him over to Caiaphas because Caiaphas has already made orders that he's the head boss, he's the high priest. He believes that the Bible says that Jesus the Messiah has to be put to death. And so Caiaphas wants to tell everybody now we have to kill Jesus. That's verse number 14, 18, 14. John 18, 14. Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews. It's best, it's expedient, it's necessary that one man die for the people because he had read Isaiah 53 and Caiaphas was, was a Bible person and he knew that he had, he had ordered Jesus dead. Now the first time Jesus is called the king is found in uh, in uh, 18, verse 19 to 22, you'll see that we get some idea here what they're going to do to Jesus. And uh, they say to Jesus, uh, verse 19, 1819, a high priest asked Jesus about his doctrine, about his 
uh, beliefs in religion. Jesus answered, I spoke openly. I ever taught in your synagogue, in the temple, uh, whether the Jews were. I didn't do anything in secret. Why you ask me? Ask them uh, that heard me speak. They know what I said, and they smacked him right in the face. 1822. And one of the soldiers slugged him with his fist right in the face at Caiaphas' house. This is the night before the next day when they nailed him to the tree. Answer thou the high priest so, uh, chapter 18, verse 22. And then in verse number 33, 1833, here we have the first time they call, there's nine of these, where they call Jesus uh, the king of the Jews. Verse 1833, Pilate answered under the, in the judgment hall. Now, Pilate now is the next day, and this is the next day, and he's over in the courthouse. And he's left the house of Caiaphas in the courthouse, 1833. Are you the king of the Jews, he said? And of course, Jesus said, he's not going to admit it. Did others tell you that of me, Jesus said? And then the second time, uh, he is acknowledged as a king, verse 36, 1836. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of the world, I, my servants would fight. I, I would not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from them. And then the third time he calls himself the king, verse 37, 1837. Therefore said he, are you a king then? Verse 37, Jesus said, you say that I'm a king. To, the, to this end I was born. And for this cause I came into the world, because he's going to be a king. He's going to be the great king coming, because he knew that the prophecy was that he'd be the king, the star, uh, as we read earlier, uh, when we were reading the story about uh, uh, the prophecy. Uh, and so then he says, in verse number 39, this is the fourth time Jesus is called the king. And I'm in 1839. Ye have a custom that I would release unto you one of the, in, at, at the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? And they screamed and hollered. Then they screamed and hollered, not this man, but Barabbas. They wanted a criminal. And they preferred a criminal over Jesus. And so that was the nature of the fallen blindness of the Jewish people there. Uh, and then chapter 19, Pilate then went and scourged him. And that means he ripped off his, hot, his hide with skin, with nails, and glass, and uh, with a cat of nine tails. They whipped him and, and opened up uh, his wounds all across the body, his body, his face. And of course, then they put a crown on his head. So they tortured him. And then in verse number 3, 19-3, they say, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him with their fist in their hands. So that was the fifth time. And we're talking about nine times when they call him the king. And then if you'll notice, uh, that was number five. Number six is found in verse 14, 1914. It was a sixth hour, 12 o'clock noon. And Jesus now said, uh, and he said, now this is, you know, Pilate is doing the talking, verse 14. Behold your king, 1914. They cried away with him, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith to them, shall I crucify your king? And so, once again, this is the seventh time that he's been identified as the king. The chief priest said, we don't have a king but Caesar. The king here is being identified as number seven. So they delivered him, therefore, to be crucified. They wanted to nail him now. They took Jesus and led him away. And then in verse 17, 18, and 19, you're going to have the eighth time when Jesus is called the king. And that's what we're talking about in John. Nine times where he's referred to as a king because he has to fulfill the prophecy that we had early in the book of Numbers where Balaam was telling the, the whole world that the king is going to come someday. And that was 2417, if you remember, 2217, or 2417 back earlier in the Bible message of 2417 of the book of Numbers. And then in chapter 19, this is the eighth time now, uh, verse 17, 1917. He bearing the cross, he went forth, it was called the place of the skull, Golgotha, it looked like uh, a man's head. It was called Golgotha, it's a hill of death. They crucified him, two others with them, one on either side. So there's three crosses there. And then Pilate writes a title, puts it on the cross, 
Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And in those letters, it's encoded, equal letter sequence. Every fourth letter is encoded, uh, hidden in a code. And uh, we've been told that. And so Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, every fourth letter is Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, or Yahweh, uh, that is written there in the message in 1919, the King of the Jews. And so now we are, uh, that was uh, prophecy number eight. We've got one more. And so here we have, they come out and they offer Jesus vinegar. This is verse uh, number 28. He says, I thirst. They give him vinegar and offer it. He doesn't take the vinegar. And then he screams out, verse number 30, uh, it is finished. And he bows his head. He gives up the ghost. And so that is the time when we have Jesus just paying for our sins on the cross. And so number nine is supposed to be verse 21. And so in 1921, it was the ninth time when Jesus cried, it is finished. 1921, look there please. Chapter 19, verse 21. And this is the ninth time where he's declared to be the king. John 19, 21. The chief priests and the Jews to Pilate wrote, don't write he's the king of the Jews, but write, I said he's the king of the Jews. And then Paul, uh, Pilate said, oh, no, 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 I've written that. Don't, and they didn't like him to honor the words of Jesus. Don't even honor him. He said, Pilate said, no, I wrote it. He's the king of the Jews. Nine times, he's the king of the Jews. Nine is three times three. That's kind of a number that's very important when you go to the study of the Bible, how it's made in all the numbers. Three is the number of certainty. It's the number of life. And 24 times, Jesus said, I'll come out on the, 20, on the, on the third day. Three, thrice. The letter three, the number three. And on the third day, Jesus changed a rock into plants in the book of Genesis. You know, on the, what we call the third day. So threes are important. But back now, here Jesus is now, they've killed him. He said it is finished. They take a spear, they run it all the way through him, verse number 34, and the soldier pierces his side and comes out, two things, blood for atonement and water to wash our sins away, uh, the, but it's the water of the body of blood of Jesus Christ. Blood and water come out, picture of your memorial service when you take communion, blood and water. And so Jesus is buried. He's put into the tomb. It's a pe preparation day. So he's going to be put there Wednesday night in the evening sometime after 6 or 7 o'clock, 6 o'clock. <clears throat> and he stays in there uh, all the way from Wednesday at that time, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And Jesus comes out at night, sometimes at night, before the morning. Uh, you'll see that all the way through. Because in all the cases, it, it always says, they saw him early in the morning while it was yet dark. So he has to be put in there three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And so to me, Brother Ray says he went in there Wednesday night, probably about six o'clock. And three days and three nights, and he comes out sometime late Saturday night. And they, they, they know, they see him early in the morning. They say, well, you know, it's still night, nighttime. So three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, 24 times, he says, I'm coming out on the third day, like Jones. So. <clears throat> putting all those in your mind. And uh, so now, here we have the first day of the week. This is Sunday morning. Here you have a whole gang of people. First of all, the women are coming. There's three different women. And then the disciples are coming, and then everybody else is coming. So it won't be long before everybody's coming. But as they come, the only people that are at the tomb, it's still night, early, is the two angels. The two angels are there. And so early in the morning, they come running, chapter 20, Sunday morning early while it's still dark and the disciples are coming, the Marys are coming and then Simon Peter comes and looks into the tomb and he sees that the clothes of Jesus are all folded up. This is verse 6. And he said, well, Jesus is gone but he left his clothes. They knew that Jesus would never leave his clothes in the pile. And so they knew that he would actually came back and folded up his clothes and two angels are saying he's not here. They were wrapped together, verse 7, in a plate by itself. Chapter 20. And Mary is outside the tomb and she's weeping. She doesn't understand. She loved Jesus. She thought he was the Messiah. He let her down, you know, and so she's weeping. And the two angels see her. Chapter 20, verse 12. 
And they see, uh, she said, why do you weep? And they said, well, they've taken away my Lord. I don't know where he's at. Is Mary's answer. Why are you weep? And then Jesus stands right there and he calls her. And he says, Mary. She turned herself, or 16, 2016. And he says, Rabboni. And she turns around and calls him Rabboni. Master. And don't touch me. He said, I haven't gone to heaven. i got to take my body and the blood and the water. I have to take it to heaven, or 17, 2017. Now, they come to the house. It's the same night. And at the house, they got all of the disciples there except... <clears throat> They don't have Judas. It's at night, 20, verse 19. It's the first day of the week. It's at night. The doors are shut. Jesus comes right in, walks through the door. And they look at him, and they, he shows them his hands and his feet, for 2020. And they were glad when they saw the Lord. They knew that he had risen from the grave. They were scared to death. And then eight days later, verse 20, verse 26, 2026, eight days later, who comes through the doors? In the house at night, here comes Jesus walking right through the door, and he tells Thomas, verse 27, look at 20, 27. Thomas, take your finger, take your hand, put it in my side, your finger in the holes, and don't be faithless, believe, verse 27. Thomas says, my Lord and my God. What a wonderful story. And then Jesus tells everybody to go out. And repent, go to and wait on the book of Acts. So in the book of Acts, we pick that up. And if you look at verse Acts chapter 1, 8, 9, 10, and 11, please notice something. Acts 8, 9, 10, and 11. Jesus is now 50 days. And we have Jubilee, 50 days, you know. And Jesus is coming by the power of the Holy Ghost. And he goes up to the clouds. This is chapter Acts 1, 8. And they see him ascend up. Uh, through the, uh, into the, you know, he's in Jerusalem, and when he spoke these things, he goes up to the clouds, verse uh, 9, and there's a cloud, he goes right up to the clouds, and then the two angels uh, say in verse 11, you men of Galilee, why are you standing here gazing? The same Jesus, verse 11, chapter Acts 1, 11, same Jesus has got to come back the same way. And so, Christian soldier, Ray Nichols believes that you and I are going to see that day. I believe it's that close. I think we're actually going to see the rapture. I do believe that. And so my thinking is that Jesus comes in the middle of the seven years of tribulation. I don't think he comes at any other time. My Bible study, he comes in the middle and we're going to see it. And that means that all the churches, wherever they're at, are now called saints. So the church is called saints. And all the way through 11 times, the word churches this is used in Revelation 22, the churches. And so when somebody tells you the word church, churches are not revelation, they're lying to you. The word churches is used in Revelation 22. It's the same. In other words, all saved people are not referred to particularly just the church. They're referred to as saints 11 times. And so it's a misguided idea. And many people have been teaching that for the last 200 years. So misguided ideas, not studying carefully. So now the day of Pentecost has come, chapter 2, would you look there, and here's where you hear the sound of the Russian mighty wind, it's a 50 days, 120 there, and dancing lights are on their head, and they're not playing any rock and roll, there's no rock and roll band, there's no words on a screen, it's not a sacrilegious thing, the Holy Spirit is there, chapter 2 of Acts, the sound of a mighty wind, but no wind there, just a sound, and there's cloven tongues. This is flashing lights on top of their head. They're filled with the Holy Ghost. And so God has evidence the filling of the Holy Ghost by flashing lights on your head. When you get somebody that speaks in tongues and they have the Holy Ghost and they believe that, make sure there's fire dancing on their head because if it's not, it's faint, it's phony, it's not real. You see, the real tongues is that they have some signs. You mean have to allow noise? You have the dancing lights on her head, you see. And they're all speaking in eight or 17 known languages. So there's a lot of things that are being taught here about uh, this idea that you can speak and get the Holy Ghost uh, in unknown tongues. The word unknown does not appear in the Bible, Christian. That's a word that's been stuck in there along with uh, things that have been taught for the last 200 years. And we call it a movement. Yep. Mm -hmm. So it says in verse number eight, 
and 11, it says uh, that you have the word our, our tongues, two times. It says own language, two times. That's four times it tells you that uh, these are known languages. There's not unknown language. The word unknown does not appear. It says own uh, t twice. It says our uh, twice. And so we're talking about our tongues, verse 11. Chapter 2, verse 11, uh, it lists all kinds of languages here. They're speaking in their, as their own tongue that they were born, verse 8. And then it says our tongues in verse 11. So these are real languages. They're not speaking in any unknown language. So if you've accepted that, you know, that you have an unknown language and that this is supposed to be evidence that you have the Holy Ghost, uh, be careful. Because I heard uh, one, one uh, TBN minister uh, the other night, and uh, this is a great minister, a black minister that has probably the largest, one of the largest followings anywhere in the whole world. And he's a great guy. I always listen to him. He's a great man of God. But he did say that uh, uh, that Jesus got the Holy Ghost uh, when he got baptized by John the Baptist. You see, when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, he didn't have the Holy Ghost. He said he didn't have it. He got the Holy Ghost there. No, he didn't really get the Holy Ghost. It was the beginning of his public ministry, and he, was, he has to have a beginning. And so John is baptizing him. But John is not baptizing him with the Holy Ghost. That's, that's erroneous. That's cephalodollar. He, he's saying that. Because he, he's teaching everybody that you have to speak in tongues, or you don't have the Holy Ghost, and that uh, Jesus was baptized with the Holy Ghost. And, and so, but that was not the reason for it. Jesus is beginning his public ministry with John the Baptist. He's not getting the Holy Ghost because he is the Holy Ghost. Christ was born the Son of God. Luke 1, 23 and 26. He doesn't become the Son of God. Jesus is born the Son of God. He's called the Son of the Highest by Gabriel the angel uh, to Mother Mary. So it, it's kind of a way that, you know, you kind of get everybody to follow that you have to be baptized with the Holy Ghost or you don't, you know. Look, you got the Holy Ghost when you have the Holy Bible in your hand, okay? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. I didn't write that. God wrote it. The Word. The King James Version in the English language. The Word was and is God. So when you read the Bible, these thoughts right here are the Holy Spirit speaking to you. You're getting the Holy Ghost right off the pages while you read the Bible. And you don't go looking for it someplace. You look it right in your Bible. And whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is Acts chapter 2. And this is what we're supposed to be teaching everybody. In the last days, God's going to pour out His Spirit. And then 21, it tells you. 21, in the last days, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord. See, you can't call on Jesus to save you. you got to call on the Lord Jesus. Paul only calls Jesus... Uh, 11 times the word Jesus. Every other place, 750 times, he calls Jesus three words. Two to three. Lord Jesus Christ, 750 times. He doesn't call him Jesus. So when you hear these guys, and you hear them all the time on radio and television, they never mention any two names for Jesus. Hardly ever. Very rarely. Sometimes they mention Jesus. But they don't call him the Lord Jesus Christ. Two names have to be spoken or, you, or Jesus can't hear you. He doesn't hear anybody's prayer that calls him Jesus. That's his earthly name. You call him Jesus the Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, two out of the three days, like Paul did, and he'll get his attention. If you just call him Jesus, that's the way the world wants you to. That means you dance your way to heaven, you have some lights, you have some music, and a few words. So they, many of those people, they learn their Bible by going to the church. They don't learn the Bible by reading the Bible. They learn it because they went to church, and they got taught that. So... Learn your Bible by reading the King James and be ready for the coming of the Lord. Now I'm asking you to turn, please, in Revelation 21, because here is where we find that it's important, Christian soldier. Turn there, would you? Revelation 21, because here we have Jesus being identified as God Almighty coming in flames of fire. And it's necessary you read this with me. I'm reading quickly Revelation 21, 1 to 3. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, the first heaven and the earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. In other words, we don't have regular earth, we don't have people there, 
Verse 2. I saw the holy city, 21, 2, Revelation, coming down from God out of heaven as a bride. So you have to marry Jesus. And so the holy city is coming down, and we're getting an idea of what we call Jesus. The holy city is coming down. You're the bride of Jesus Christ. Chapter 22, verse 1, we're reading. He shows me a pure river of water of life as crystal proceeding out of the throne of God. And you see that? And then he tells you that Jesus is saying, verse 7, Behold, I come suddenly. This is the Lord Jesus Christ coming. I come suddenly, quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. So the word prophecy here means you don't change anything. You don't add. You don't take away anything that John writes. John tells you if you take away any of the words of the prophecy of the Bible, the words of Jesus in Scripture, he will remove your name from the book of life. It's a threat. 22, verse number uh, 7, Jesus says he's coming back. Now here's where we find Jesus as a star. Would you look? And I'm in 22, verse 12. Behold, I come suddenly. My reward is with me. I'm going to give every man according to his work. Your work certainly is going to be uh, appreciate it. Jesus is going to let you rule the angels one day. That's what he says. You're going to rule with him for a thousand years also. Revelation 22, 13. I am Alpha, Omega. I'm beginning and the ending of... I'm, Jesus is an indescribable, powerful being like, like just all the stars put together. I'm Alpha. I'm the beginning. I'm the ending of the, of the Hebrew Greek alphabet. So, and then he tells you uh, blessed are they that do the commandments that have the right to the tree of life that you can enter into the gates into the city because we're talking about this eternal city now now notice the, the title for Jesus 22, 15, and 16 outside are dogs these are people that are lost they're the blind they're sorcerers they follow Satan they're hormones they're sex maniacs now they're murderers they kill everybody they're idolaters they, they worship uh, the sun, the moon, and the star and they, they worship money. Whosoever loves and makes a lie. If you believe and tell lies and you're on the new service, you won't be rewarded for that. That's for certain. In verse 16, I, Jesus, I sent mine angel to testify to you the things of the church. Here it is. I am the root and offspring of David. I am the bright and the morning star. So we finally got to that part of the message that we had when we were looking at numbers. Earlier in numbers, we found that uh, it was important for you to see that. Now, as I close out, would you look at the book of Zechariah just for a verse? Jesus has to come back to Jerusalem, would you? Donald Trump has taken us there, and I'm reading Zechariah chapter 8. The word of the Lord of hosts, Zechariah 8. Thus saith the Lord, I am jealous for Zion. That's the name of Jerusalem. I was jealous for her. That's where Donald Trump is going now, possibly to build the wall, possibly to help build the temple. Temple has to be built. Thus saith the Lord, verse 3, I am returned to Zion. I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth. The embassy there, it's important. He's fulfilling the scripture. And so God is putting it in his mind to do what God wants him to do. And that's Jerusalem, chapter 8 of Zechariah. The mountain, the kingdom of the Lord of hosts. And the Lord of hosts is going to be there. And then you're going to find this in the millennium, verse 4. That right for old men and old women are going to dwell there. Going to have a lot of people there for a thousand years, and then he says he's going to save my people. Verse seven from the east country and west. I'll bring them back. That was 1948. I'll bring them back. They'll dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. That's Zechariah eight, verse eight, eight eight. Zechariah, and he comes back 1948. Now we've got 70 years that we have to add there because we call it the fig tree generation. And you know that too, that Jesus taught the fig tree generation. And that's why we now know 2018, we're so concerned, because it's 70 years from the time that Jesus brought everybody back in 1948. 70 years is May the 15th, 2018. So you want to be looking for some big things, some 30 or 40 nations coming there. And that's just a month from now. We're going to see some big things. And God is going to use uh, Donald Trump. This is found in chapter 10. Verse number six. This speaks of Great Britain, and it speaks of Pence and Trump, and it speaks of Jerusalem, chapter 10, Zechariah, about the last uh, millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Chapter 10, verse 1. 
Ask you the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. God's going to bring bright showers, 10-1. And he's going to give showers of rain to everyone grass. The whole world is going to be changed. It's going to be a beautiful time. And then he tells you here about the use of the United States. Verse 10-6. I will strengthen the house of Judah. That's a kingly tribe. That's Great Britain. I will save the house of Joseph. House of Joseph is none other than Manasseh and Ephraim. And the house of Joseph represents Donald Trump. It represents the people that came on the Mayflower in 1610. All of our people got on the Mayflower, 102 of them, they came from Lincolnshire, England, and they were from the tribe of Manasseh. And that's all the truth of the history of American people. Where do we come from? We came from London. We came from uh, the east part of London and east part of Great Britain. And Lincolnshire was the name of the county. And Norfolk and Lincolnshire are the names of the county, and they are in England, and that's where our Pilgrim Fathers came, 102 on the Mayflower. They came over here, they established Philadelphia. Philadelphia is uh, Revelation uh, chapter 3, verse 7 to 10. It tells us that Philadelphia is going to be spared during the Great Tribulation, 3, 7 to 10, Revelation. So uh, God has chosen Donald Trump. We're the house of Joseph, 10 6, Zechariah. And that's important that you pick all these things together. As we close, would you seek the Lord and pray with me? Father, in Christ Jesus' name, once again, we thank you for the privilege of ministering to many, many kids that we used to know at Broward Christian School. And we think of uh, Barnett. Uh, pray for your guiding mercies on him and his family, Baradella. We pray for the Wilsons. We pray for the young people that used to be with us in the Broward Christian School. And wherever they're at tonight on Facebook, we got many of the Cavo family. And uh, we just ask for your blessings on them. We pray that they would be strong in the Lord. Pray, Lord, that they would determine while they're on Facebook to stand up for the things of God and post anything at all that deals with the love of Jesus. No one can understand it, the great power of a star, the great power of a king like that would rule the whole universe, Jesus Christ, who can't understand the love of God. Christian soldier, God is not mad at you. He's never going to be mad. He loves you. No matter what you do to him, you hurt his feeling, he's going to love you. He's going to forgive you. The love of God is greater far than a star pen could ever tell. I hope tonight, Christian soldier, dedicate yourself to Christ. Let him be first place. Be a, a real determined person, a patriot for Jesus. I trust you would. Love you, Christian soldiers. See you on Facebook. God bless. Pray for Donald Trump. Pets. Now they're meeting tonight. Yes, they are. We understand that he's having a meeting with North Korea about the big bomb. You know, the one that blows everything up. So wherever he goes, God is trying to help the Christians get behind our country. Make it great again. Great Britain, United States, we're in the Bible. Get that in your mind, Christian soldier, and tell everybody around you, help make America great again.